quite to talk about. So I actually have quite a bit of information to cover. I'm going to go super fast um, so that this isn't boring for you. Um, and then I um, would certainly like to open up to, to questions after that. So, um, so please bear with me. Um, so first, I always like to start with a quick historical perspective on um, where we're at. And um, so for instance, um, since the year 2000, we've had 15 out of 20 of our largest wildland fires throughout the state. Um, and these uh, records date back to 1932. So clearly something is changing. Um, We've had eight of our most destructive fires just in the last 24 months. And one of the things that I'd like to point out here is that um, you know, normally we think of large and, and damaging fires occurring down in Southern California, but a majority of the most destructive fires that we've had recently have actually been in Northern California, um, which is something of a shift. Um, and, um, and so we're seeing uh, more larger and more devastating fires in the north um, than we previously had been. And then um, lastly, and most unfortunately, we've had five of the most deadly since 2017. And, and I think um, most of us thought um, 85 fatalities in a fire would be something almost unheard of in California. However, um, we have a number of communities that are clearly um, under risk with a lot of the changes that we're seeing with our climate and the way that wildfires are now impacting um, communities at, at levels that we previously just hadn't seen before. So um, I, I always seem to be the bearer of bad news, but there is some good news. And the good news is, is that in 2019, um, it's not one for the record books. So, um, so far in 2019, we have not broken into the top 20 for either the largest, the most destructive, or um, the most deadly fires um, in the state. So, for that, I certainly am very, very thankful. Um, just kind of um, looking back at the last couple of years to kind of set the stage on, you know, what's changing. Um, in 2017, we had, um, you know, really devastating fires, both in Northern California, the Wine Country fires, as well as the Thomas fire down in Ventura County, um, followed by the floods in Montecito, which were a direct result of what we saw in, uh, with the Thomas fire. Um, and it seemed like to, to many of us, including myself, I thought those were career fires, something that I would never see again, ever. Um, but of course, 2018 um, came along and um, it completely obliterated the records of 2017, not only um, eclipsing the Tubbs fire as the most destructive um, with the camp, but also the um, uh, Mendocino complex, which became the largest fire um, burning in, um, in a number of counties around Lake County, um, eclipsing the Thomas fire from 2017 in Ventura. Um, so clearly something is, is changing. Um, so what I wanted to do for this webinar today was um, kind of talk about how did we get here? What are the current issues we are facing? What is different and why? And what are we doing about it? Um, I think those are a lot of questions that people generally have about you know, what, is, what is going on. So how did we get here? So certainly the drought that we had, the five-year drought in California, um, did have an impact, big impact on our fuels. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, we've seen increasing climatic temperatures throughout the state, um, declining snowpacks. We have unresilient overstocks here in forests. Um, we've had um, nearly 100 years of fire exclusion now throughout the state. We'll talk more about that. Um, forest management policies that have created overgrown and overcrowded forests. Um, I also want to talk about land use planning legacies and land use planning issues that we're facing in the state with construction. And then um, also older construction types with our homes and certainly seeing a difference between homes that were built um, prior to implementation of Chapter 7A of our fire code, um, which um, requires different building techniques um, so that homes um, can be able to be hardened or more ignition resistant from um, radiant heat and embers and things along those lines. So, um, so some current trends. So certainly our fire seasons are getting longer, right? We're, we're not talking about fire seasons as much as we are about fire years. It's a, it's a year-round issue that we have to face. And, um, and so um, our seasons, or are, are, you know, at least in, in many parts of the state, you know, we, we have a, a fire season that's 78 days longer across the West than it was just three to four decades ago. And certainly that correlates to, to earlier snow melt and also um, different elevations on where the snow is. The other um, 
issue that we're facing is we have altered fire regimes. So prior to um, European settlement of California, um, prior to fire suppression efforts, um, many parts of the state had um, uh, fire return intervals that were anywhere between, for instance, um, using Lake Tahoe as an example um, on the east shore, um, fire may naturally have run through that area about every three to seven years. Um, in some areas, maybe up to 20 or 30 years. But the point is, is that fire is a natural part of the landscape. And fire burned naturally um, uh, under uh, lower intensity conditions than it does today, primarily because we've been so successful at fire suppression that we have this buildup of forest fuels now, um, which is obviously problematic for us. Um, and um, in, in many parts of the state, where we're finding is the greatest departure from that, what we call fire return interval, is in the low and middle elevation vegetation types throughout California. Um, one of the things that I wanted to point out is we often talk about increasing climactic temperatures, um, and I'll get there here in a second, but I also wanted to show you that we're also seeing um, temperatures, uh, minimum temperatures that are increasing as well. And the reason that this is important is because generally at night is a, an opportune time for firefighters to be more successful in suppressing fires. Uh, the humidities are higher, the temperatures are lower, fire behavior um, is less. However, what we're seeing is we're seeing during the nighttime that we're, we're seeing that actually that our, our temperatures aren't dropping as low as they used to, that our humidity levels aren't going up as high as they used to. So, um, so we're seeing, in some cases, very extreme um, fire conditions and fire intensity, even at night. And um, so that's what you're seeing on the right-hand side of this graph, is you're seeing that um, minimum um, temperature departure that's occurring. And you can kind of see how it correlates with just as we're getting past about 1990, um, you know, how that, those trends are starting to increase, which is interesting only in that um, since 2000, that's really when we um, started to see a dramatic increase in um, the size and severities of fires throughout California. Um, as most of you may know, our average annual air temperatures are increasing in California. And so uh, this is a graph that shows dating back to 1895 all the way um, past 2015. And so um, in California, on average, um, those temperatures have increased about two degrees which to some people may not seem like a lot, um, but um, the way I like to frame this is if our natural body temperature is 98.6, if it was 100.6 all the time, I, I don't think we would be feeling very well. It would have a huge impact on us. And so certainly it has a huge impact on um, the way fires burn throughout the state. Um, I also put a little fact there. Um, I thought this was really interesting. Um, so, um, when it comes to drought in California, five of the state's years with severe to extreme drought since record keeping began in 1895 occurred between 2007 and 2016, which really speaks to the historic nature of the drought that we had in California recently um, and, um, and the impacts that that had on us as well. So I um, also wanted to make sure that we don't forget about tree mortality. Um, uh, we're up to 147 million dead trees throughout the state, almost 10 million acres that are impacted. Um, the good news is, is that um, as we came out of the drought, we saw um, those, those really epidemic levels of tree mortality begin to decline um, as um, forests began to, um, and trees began to get the, the water that they needed, um, bark beetle populations began to drop, um, but it really speaks to overall the unresilient nature of our landscapes um, when we have this level of mortality throughout the state. And um, I like to call it a slow motion natural disaster and like a wildfire that's kind of burned very, very quickly. Um, and within hours, you could have thousands, literally tens of thousands of acres um, destroyed in a wildfire. Um, this is one of those disasters that, that occurs over months and years. And um, uh, one of the things we've been doing, um, working with the Forest Service, is um, uh, mapping the progression of tree mortality throughout the state. Um, on the left-hand side is the um, aerial detection surveys from the Forest Service um, dating back to 2014. And then on the right is a, a CAL FIRE map, and um, the red is the tree mortality, and then what you can see with that orange color 
is the areas where we've had tree mortality as a result of wildfire. And what really strikes me about this is just really how much area across California um, that both wildfire and tree mortality is impacting communities um, throughout the state. So um, what does the new normal look like? Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this fire here in a little bit, but um, needless to say, there were boats in, in those um, boat slips um, prior to this fire burning um, through this area. But um, the new normal is different. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to use the car fire as a case study just to talk about some of the things that we've been seeing, um, how it relates on a statewide basis, and, um, and talk about some of the extreme weather also associated with this particular incident, which is not necessarily unique to other fires. So the car fire actually started um, as a result of a vehicle um, sparking a fire. It was a, a, um, a travel trailer in the Whiskey Town National Recreation Area, which is managed by the National Park Service. And it burned 229,000 acres, destroyed over 1,600 structures, and there was eight um, fatalities in that fire. So, um, so this fire um, progressed basically from Whiskey Town Lake, burned into French Gulch, um, and then under very extreme weather conditions, it pushed into Western Redding. Um, when I, when I arrived at this fire um, the day after it started, I really thought that you know, we would be able to catch it within a couple days, but I had no idea that the type of weather event that was gonna set up over the area that was going to um, greatly influence the fire behavior and do some things that we simply hadn't, hadn't seen before. So um, the fire started on uh, July 23rd, um, 2018. Um, Redding had been um, under multiple days of over 100 degree temperatures. Um, so it certainly was very dry and, and we had seen you know, a lot of fire activity um, prior to this fire throughout the state. Um, during one of the runs of the fire, it actually burned down into Whiskey Town Lake. And, um, and normally we would think of boats as being perfectly protected um, out on water, um, surrounded, surrounded by water, obviously. Um, but I was just astounded when I went down to this marina um, as the fire was making its run. I saw a number of CAL FIRE engines down in this area with hose lays deployed into this marina, and I was very confused as to why that was. Um, but just the sheer intensity and the amount of embers that were produced on the first run of the car fire as it came back down toward, towards um, the Whiskey Town Lake, um, multiple um, boats were destroyed in that fire. And, and certainly, you know, one of the results of that was just the amount of oils and petroleum products um, and pollution um, in that lake following um, the destruction of this marina. And this is, you know, this is something that's was new to me. I, I had never seen a fire um, have this kind of impact on a marina. Because like I said, normally you would think that this would be um, somewhat of a safe space um, in the event of a wildfire, but, but clearly it wasn't, and it just speaks to the intensity. So um, the fire made a second run, um, and this is a video taken as the fire was moving um, east um, from the Whiskey Town Lake area down towards the Sacramento River. And um, I'm gonna talk a little bit here in a, in a, about some of the um, fire weather conditions that set up, but as this fire moved down, this is a camera that was at one of the, um, the dams on the Sacramento River, and this is right before the fire crossed um, the river and started uh, moving up into Western Reading. But you can see on the right-hand side of the screen that funnel that's starting to occur. Um, and, um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the dynamics that set up to, to cause this. Um, but this was just um, really the beginning of, of what became a much, much larger event here. So as that fire crossed the Sacramento River, um, it also formed this fire tornado. And, um, this fire tornado actually was uh, EF3 strength, 136 to 165 miles an hour um, as it came across uh, from the Sacramento River up into Western Reading, and you can see all the structures down there. Um, this is not something we had seen before, um, not, not to this extent. Um, temperatures up to um, 2,700 degrees um, in this fire tornado. 
And what was interesting is as this um, fire tornado was burning, there wasn't any firefighters that actually verbalized that there was a tornado in the area because quite frankly, it was not something we had ever seen before. Um, but it did have um, pretty devastating con uh, consequences. Um, here's another thing that we're seeing a lot more. So as, that, as the car fire burned into Western Reading, um, oops, excuse me, as the fire burned into Western Reading, um, obviously we're seeing um, much greater um, impacts on the communities. And, and this is the kind of environment that firefighters are now working in, unfortunately. Um, multiple structures that are burning um, at the same time. Um, and it's really just trying to find a location where you can, as a firefighter, anchor in and um, prevent further destruction in these, um, in these areas. And um, in this area, um, uh, which is um, Lake Redding, um, down near the Sacramento River, it's a beautiful neighborhood. It's not something that you would really consider wildland urban interface. Um, and it certainly had a huge impact on that entire um, community. But again, these, these are the kinds of um, conditions that our firefighters are currently having to, um, to work in more and more often. So um, with some of the effects of these fires and some of the, the weather that they're creating, um, not only has um, you know, an impact in terms of fire, but also um, surrounding areas as well. So, um, as the car fire progressed into Western Reading, um, uh, some of the weather dynamics that set up um, really caused effects that looked more like a tornado um, in terms of its impact on communities. Um, this here are, these are some vehicles and in the background is um, some power poles um, that actually were destroyed in that fire tornado. Um, like I said, it was, it was something out of a storybook in terms of what you would you know, see in areas of the country where we actually do have tornadoes fairly often in terms of the impacts. You can see um, where that um, incident meteorologist is standing. You'll notice um, it's all dirt. All of the organic material on the ground is gone, um, completely swept away by both the fire and the tornado um, because of the immense amount of heat that was burning. And then if you also, on the trees, you'll notice that um, some of the trees don't have bark anymore. Um, it was simply like it was um, sandblasted away. Um, it was so intense. Um, there was a house here um, that's, that's gone. Um, it just seems mind boggling that, you know, um, that fire in combination with weather could, could create these kinds of events. And then obviously some of the ancillary damage that occurred um, around that area with uprooted trees. Um, like you also saw with that roof that was um, that was um, torn off. So one of one of the, the the point I'm trying to make here is that we see these extreme weather events that um, are setting up over the state in certain areas that, in combination with a wildland fire and the unresilient landscapes that we're that we're dealing with, um, where we, we we are seeing things that we haven't seen before, and so. This is um, how that during the car fire, this is, this is a kind of visual representation of what the weather was like that particular day. So if you'll notice, um, in the northern Sacramento Valley on the right hand side of that picture, we had a record high of that day, 113 degrees, uh, which is 13 degrees above normal. Not to mention that we had um, you know, a streak of, of, of numerous days of above 100 degree temperatures in Reading. Um, on the coast, however, near Eureka, California, it was 59 degrees. So it was five degrees below average. And so this created a thermal gradient between the ocean and the northern Sacramento Valley that was very high. And as a result, a thermal low developed in the Sacramento Valley, which essentially creates this vacuum that begins to rise. And it begins to draw air from the Pacific Ocean down over the coastal range into Northern Sacramento Valley. And as those winds go over that coastal range and begin to drop, they become drier and they also increase in velocity. So what sets up essentially is as those high velocity descending surface winds come down into the valley and they hit the Sacramento River, the way we, we can best describe it, it's like a hydraulic jump. And, um, and so if you've ever seen an area where water is going down um, a gradient where there's cement 
and it's hitting water that isn't isn't moving it creates this really turbulent kind of area where the where the water um, the, the moving water and the, the water that's not moving creates this um this turbulence and essentially that's what happened in this case is we had this very um this these winds that were coming down slope um, hitting an area where there was was a more stable air mass and it was causing these turbulent swirling winds to occur that in combination with the fire and the convective heat that was rising resulted in that fire tornado occurring so essentially we have this really extreme weather event set up over that part of the state in combination with the fire and um, and you guys all saw the results of that here just a second ago um, the other um, case study that I want to look at is the Woolsey fire. And the Woolsey fire and the campfire both started on the same day in November 8th, 2018, um, but with some really different outcomes. So the Woolsey fire, um, as many of you may remember, started just south of Simi Valley in Southern California. For 96,000 acres, there were 1,600 structures that were destroyed and, and three fatalities. But one of the things that I wanted to point out here is in Southern California, and you can see how rapidly this, this fire moved down towards the coast, um, one, one of the big differences between Woolsey and fire, um, especially being down in Southern California, is really just the transportation system in Southern California. The transportation system in Southern California is, is able to handle literally millions of, of vehicles on a, on a daily basis. And so while this fire moved incredibly fast, um, and it did push quite a few people all the way down to the Pacific Ocean, um, because of a lot of the pre-planning that occurred and because of the road systems, you know, simply people were able to get out of the way. Um, some interesting similarities between, for instance, the Woolsey fire, um, the campfire, the car fire is, we have this, this mix of both um, federal lands, um, state lands, um, private property, all mixed together. And so the Woolsey Fire, for instance, even though it started in a very, very um, heavily populated area of Simi Valley, burning 3,000 oaks down past Calabasas, it, it finally moved into the Santa Monica National Recreation Area, again, another area that's managed by the National Park Service, um, and quickly moved down to the coast. And people living in Malibu certainly are used to wildland fire. They've seen lots of fire um, for those that have lived there for 30, 40, 50 years. Um, but time and time again, people told me they had never seen a fire in Malibu move that quickly. Um, they, they expected that you know, fire would impact them, um, but they didn't think it would happen as quickly as it did. So this is um, uh, in Paradise, California, the campfire. So um, as many of you are aware, there was um, um, quite a bit of um, gridlock problems with um, uh, people being able to, to get out, um, the sheer population um, up in paradise and um, that fire moving so quickly, impeding um, people's egress. Um, so big difference between Woolsey and camp in terms of um, people being able to evacuate quickly out of the area as these fires begin to spread more quickly. This is um, Paradise here, an area where all of these, these purple dots essentially represent areas where cars were abandoned, um, you know, mainly, to, mainly as a result of those escape routes being compromised. And then this is the location of um, where the, many of the fatalities occurred in Paradise. And I'd like to turn your attention to where it says the five died trapped on a street with no outlet. Um, with a lot of these um, subdivisions that have been put that were put in, you know, decades ago, um, what we see is that that um, we have subdivisions that are accessed off long dead end roads, and certainly when you combine that with communities that are um, under a high fire threat, um, that could potentially be a problem in terms of people being able to evacuate, but also for fire department resources and law enforcement resources to be able to get in help people get out if those areas are compromised. Um, this is another example of um, a long um, a dead end road. This was actually on the car fire. This is Buena Ventura Boulevard. And, um, and this road is, is 
accessing a pretty high-end um, subdivision um, called Stanford Hills Estates. Um, what you see here in front of you is essentially these um, bulldozers, which are um, firefighting bulldozers that were fighting the fire at the time, a civilian vehicle that is um, off the roadway. Um, when the car fire burned over Buenaventura Boulevard, and this is in the same location as where that fire tornado came across, um, they essentially got trapped. They, they couldn't get out. Um, there was really only one way in and one way out. And um, you can see it here. This is a Reading City Fire Department engine. Um, and you can see that these vehicles here aren't able to go down Buenaventura Boulevard because this is what they have in front of them. Um, so essentially, they're using this intersection as a temporary refuge area until the fire passes and they're able actually to not only get themselves out, but to get those civilians out of that area as well. And so you know, this is, this is um, an issue that um, the state is taking very seriously. Um, we have a land use planning program in CAL FIRE, um, and we're looking at ways with work, look, looking at ways with, to work with local jurisdictions in order to be able to find secondary means of egress out of these communities um, or subdivisions where secondary access currently doesn't exist, um, so that neither residents or firefighters get trapped. And um, I can tell you that um, this um, fire tornado, as it was burning across um, Buenaventura Boulevard, had um, major impacts. Um, unfortunately, there was um, a Reading City firefighter that was killed um, as a result of trying to get down Buenaventura Boulevard um, to this area at the time that um, this fire was burning. So, um, there's no jurisdiction that really is not at threat from wildfire. And, and the reason I put this together was just to show that, you know, a fire can start on, on forest service land, it can start in a city, it can start you know, in a county, state lands. But what we're seeing is that multiple jurisdictions are getting impacted. Um, now, and, and, you know, fire knows no jurisdiction. It will burn across multiple jurisdictions. Um, this is not just a forest service problem. It's not just a state problem. It's not just a county problem um, or a community problem. It's, it's really all of our problems. Um, it's something that each one of us has to figure out. Um, how are we going to be able to make a difference with this issue in the long run? One of the interesting um, impacts of wildfire lately um, that we're seeing more of is, you know, we always often don't go to San Francisco and think that wildfire would be a threat or have an impact on major cities. And, and that has been a change as well. Um, so during the campfire, um, San Francisco had the worst air quality in the world. And certainly that has an effect on people's health. It has an effect on the economy, um, because of, especially because of tourism. Um, schools shut down or close. Um, so there's a lot of impacts um, that normally we haven't thought about in the past in terms of how these fires are, are having a, really a, a statewide um, impact and are of statewide significance. When I was coming back home from the Woolsey fire uh, and driving up through the Central Valley, I stopped at a restaurant um, once I got back into Northern California. And one of the things that I noticed right away is that there was a number of children that were coughing and I just figured that they were sick until it really occurred to me that they weren't coughing because they were sick, they were coughing because um, the air quality was just, had been so bad for so long in that area. And you can see here um, just how one fire alone can have a huge impact in terms of smoke um, across literally the entire um, Northern state. And then this here just kind of gives you um, a satellite visual representation of, um, of how these fires grow. This is the campfire. And um, you see there's a very strong northeast wind that's pushing the fire, which is very similar to the winds that we just recently had, where it seemed like um, you know, every week we were in red flag weather conditions because of low humidities and north, north, northeast winds that were setting up over the state, which, as many of you are probably aware, were the conditions that the Kincaid Fire in Sonoma County started under um, also. Um, this is also from um, the National Weather Service, and um, this basically is just um, imagery 
showing um, the full extent of um, the smoke impacts on November 14th, 2018, um, which would have been approximately six days after the, the campfire started. And then, um, you know, clearly it's not just smoke impacts, but there's also other um, long-term impacts. This is Montecito um, following the Thomas fire in 2017. And um, there was more people killed by um, debris flows in Montecito um, following the Thomas fire um, than the fire itself. Okay, so addressing these issues, um, what are we doing about it? Um, so Cal Fire currently has, um, and I'm going to go into more detail um, on each each one of these things here in a minute. But um, we have um, Cal Fire is currently working on 35 priority projects throughout the state for fuels reduction work. Um, the governor has instituted a forest management task force, which had, was kind of arose out of the tree mortality task force to really take a much deeper and more broader look at. Um, solutions to forest management throughout the state. Um, there's been a huge investment um, in this area through the California Climate Investments and Cap and Trade. Um, currently, Cal Fire um, through Senate Bill 901 has about a billion dollars in Cap and Trade funds for forest health and fuels reduction work um, in the form of forest health and fire prevention grants as well. A lot of legislative um, solutions and also looking at streamlining regulations so that we can get more work done more quickly to communities. Um, so uh, one endeavor Cal Fire is currently working on is there's 35 um, priority projects that are adjacent to communities. Um, these priority projects will protect about 200 communities and we hope to treat 90,000 acres um, around these communities. In March, about a month after Cal Fire released this report, um, there was a state of emergency proclamation by Governor Newsom which provided the necessary regulatory relief um, for us to move forward on these projects um, and really to treat this as an emergency. Um, other things that we're doing to address these issues is we're really looking at opportunities to increase the use of prescribed fire near communities, um, working on expansion of good neighbor authority agreements, and these are agreements with, that we can enter into with the Forest Service to be able to get more work done. Um, Pre-attack planning, which I'll talk about here in a little bit, I've touched on land use planning issues, um, defensible space inspections, developing markets for biomass, uh, increasing local capacity and support of collaboratives. And I know the Sierra Nevada Alliance is involved in that as well. And then increasing public awareness in our outreach and education efforts throughout the state. Um, in addition to that, because fires are getting um, so much larger and, and severe, we certainly have to respond with the right types of equipment as well. So uh, we've added engines to our fleet, um, fire engines, and we currently are working on a C-130 um, uh, air tanker program. We have seven C-130s coming into the state that CAL FIRE will be operating in addition to the fleet that we already have. Um, we're transitioning our Super, Super Huey helicopters, which are Vietnam era helicopters, to um, to Blackhawk helicopters, S-70I Blackhawks, and those are coming online now. Um, we're increasing our dozer operator staffing, looking at opportunities to um, work with the California Book Conservation Corps. And, and, and what you'll see now at some of the 3C um, centers is you'll actually see a partnership between the 3Cs and Cal Fire to staff those hand crews as fire crews. Um, there's obviously uh, looking at increasing our technology. I'll talk about that with fire detection cameras, remote sensing. Um, and um, internally, we're also looking at our health and wellness programs because um, usually our firefighters do not walk away from some of these um, fires without some type of emotional impact. And, um, and so making sure that we're taking care of our own um, so that they can continue to do what, what they need to do to protect um, lives and property. And then um, I'll talk a little bit more about our fuels reduction and prescribed fire crews. So certainly this is Takes, takes money to do this. And so Senate Bill 901 um, provided a billion dollars over five years. Um, it's cap and trade funding. And there's up to this year, um, 90 million for forest health and fire prevention grants through Cal Fire. Um, we also maintain an urban and community forestry program. And then um, we also have allocated money for research only grants um, under this funding source. 
Um, but that funding not only goes towards grants, but it also um, funds the CAL FIRE um, fuels reduction crews. Um, there's money that goes to the California Conservation Corps so that their crews can do fuels reduction work. Um, the California National Guard crews that we're working side by side with on these, um, on the 35 priority projects, it helps fund that, um, helps fund defensible space inspectors, um, our California Forestry Improvement Program, and like I said, the 35 priority projects throughout the state. Um, and then also one of the things I just wanted to mention, it's, it's a program that isn't as well known, um, but CAL FIRE also has a forestry legacy, forest legacy program. And this is a program um, that we use to be able to um, essentially take areas of forested land and put it into a conservation easement so, um, so that there couldn't be, there won't be any kind of future development on it. Um, and it also allows that forest to be a, a carbon sink um, in the future um, under um, different um, management guidelines um, that are required under the program. So it's a great way to um, preserve land, um, um, but also to uh, manage it um, as a carbon sink in the future. Um, this is the Tahoe Central Sierra Initiative that some, some of you may be familiar with. Um, it covers over a two million acre area, and there are many, many different organizations, including the Forest Service, the Sierra Nevada Conservancy, and the Tahoe, um, California Tahoe Conservancy, um, the National Forest Foundation, among many others, that are all working together in this landscape um, to really make a difference. And this is really um, kind of a model program that's now being replicated throughout other parts of the state. Um, and again, it's, it's leveraging all the different resources that we can bring together among many, many different agencies um, to implement forest health and resiliency projects, fuels reduction work, and prescribed fire work. So clearly this is um, an example of an unresilient forest. Um, you know, these are the types of forests in some areas of the state that we're, we're dealing with. Um, this is some work that Cal Fire and the California State Parks um, did over at DL Wood State Park, um, really trying to um, make this area more resilient. And one thing about working with state parks is, is once we're able to get many of those um, fuels um, off of the ground, then we can start safely reintroducing prescribed fire into the landscape. So this is an example of good fire, right? So we, you know, we talk about fire being this, this really devastating force, but um, but it's also um, can be used for good. And, um, and it's really looking at opportunities to reintroduce that fire into the landscape at these low intensity levels to make a difference. So um, like I said, so, so CAL FIRE is currently, um, we brought on 10 new crews that are dedicated solely to fuels reduction and prescribed fire. But we also have a lot of other resources available to us. So we have 196 fire crews statewide, 343 fire engines. A lot of heavy equipment. Um, but what we're seeing, because fire seasons are getting so much longer, that the resources that we would want to use to be able to do a lot of this work oftentimes is committed you know, to emergencies throughout the state. But what we do is we take advantage of, of those times like today, for instance, um, where we're not seeing major fires throughout the state and we can utilize our emergency response resources to be able to do, to do work like prescribed fire and fuels reduction. So today, for instance, we have, we're working with state parks on the west shore of Lake Tahoe, doing some fuels reduction and prescribed fire work. We did some prescribed fire up in North Lake Tahoe about a week ago with state parks. Um, we're working with the Forest Service on a project called Fire Adapted 50, which is a fuels reduction project between um, Ice House Road in El Dorado County all the way up to Echo Summit along Highway 50. We're able to use our hand crews that normally would be out on fires to do that. Um, and then tomorrow we'll be burning down in um, outside of Pollock Pines at Slight Park um, because we have the resources available to be able to safely implement um, another prescribed burn. Um, so, um, but, but what's nice about having our 10 dedicated crews is that those crews can be dedicated year round um, to projects. And with the California National Guard being able to bolster our work, um, we're able to get a lot more done more quickly. So um, other actions that we take um, throughout the state, um, this is just resource pre-positioning. We'll, we'll, we'll place resources in different areas throughout the state based on fire weather conditions. Um, we're doing a lot of defensible space inspections and it's not just CAL FIRE. Um, 
in the Lake Tahoe Basin, for instance, um, all the fire districts are very actively doing defensible space inspections. And we all use the same tool to do that, which is the collector app. And, and our goal, um, at least within CAL FIRE, is we want to at least try to complete a quarter million defensible space inspections a year throughout the state. Um, and we all use the same um, technology to be able to do that. And it's called the collector app. And this is basically just a screenshot of um, how the collector app works, um, how we track inspections. This is actually the North Upper Truckee area where the Angora fire burned through. And those green dots are homes that have passed their principal space inspections while the yellow are those that are still not in compliance. It's a great tool for us to be able to track um, compliance and also to record a lot of data that we need to better understand how fire impacts these areas. For instance, um, the Pawnee fire, which burned in Lake County um, in 2018, on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see with the defensible space inspections that occurred in this one area. And on the left-hand side is the damage inspection data. So we use the same program not only to do defensible space inspections, but we use the same program then to go back into these areas that have been burned through um, to track um, what structures were destroyed. And um, as part of that data collection, we can look at things in terms of what kind of roof did they have? What kind of windows? Um, were their eaves enclosed? What was the access light? And that data is actually very helpful for us to be able, be able to better understand um, which homes survived and why, um, since we we had been out there before the fire struck. Um, and then it really helps us make decisions about what we can do to make a difference working with um, homeowners to harden their homes in the event that a wildfire strikes. So um, our prescribed fire goals within the department is about 25,000 acres a year that Cal Fire would like to do. Um, certainly working with partner agencies, private landowners, um, overall throughout the entire state of California, we can get a lot done. And one of the things that I'd really like to point out here is that you can see that the smoke impacts from prescribed fire are so much less than what you see with um, large wildfires. Fire intensity is less, smoke impacts are less, and these areas are gonna be far more resilient in the future in the event that a fire does run through these areas, and the resource damage is gonna be far less also. So this is, this is what we like to see. This is the kind of fire that um, is healthy for a forest. This is actually over at Sugar Pine Point State Park. This is a burn that we implemented um, last year in October, believe it or not, between um, essentially the car fire and the campfire when weather conditions were favorable for us, us to be able to safely implement fire here. And so um, this is an area that State Parks has, has burned a couple times now. And when you walk through this, you really get a sense for um, the health of, of this forest stand as well as the resilience that it will have not only the fire, but the insects and disease and future droughts. So we've, we've seen that. Um, another thing that we do is power line inspections. Um, so in areas where we do defensible space inspections in, in some parts of the state, um, we'll also be looking at the power lines and passing on any issues that, that we discover to the local utility companies, because as you all know, um, conductors certainly can be um, a problem in the event a tree falls through or a branch, um, you know, blowing in the wind goes into that conductor and starts a fire. So um, we're very, very cognizant of that. And then pre-attack planning. Pre-attack planning is a process that fire agencies do in order to really pre-plan an environment in advance of a fire. And these maps are all geo-referenced um, and can be shared to incoming resources. And essentially, it gives us that opportunity to be able to look at where fuels reduction work has already been done, um, where we can put people in the event that we have um, egress challenges with people getting out, um, where our staging locations for equipment is, um, where we know we're going to have problems on roadways. Um, it helps us identify where homes are located. And there's a number of things here that really help us tactically be more successful, as well as identifying um, areas where um, hospitals are, or schools, or nurseries, or elderly care facilities. So we know where those all are in advance, which really helps us be more successful and also um, gives us that opportunity to be able to get people um, out of the way more quickly. 
Um, and then um, I'm just going to wrap up with this. Is um, Obviously, technology plays a huge role and is going to play a much larger role. Um, the alert wildfire system that has been set up throughout the state is just remarkable. All the cameras that have been set up. This is the Emerald Fire that took place in 2016 near Emerald Bay and South Lake Tahoe. Um, our command centers all have access to these cameras. So as soon as someone may call in a fire, um, pretty much, well, I don't want to say anywhere in the state, but in many areas of the state, um, we're able to um, very quickly look at what the fire is doing and then make tactical and strategic decisions about um, resource deployments. Um, and it gives us intelligence um, that we need before we even get to a fire. Um, this is also, uh, this is remote sensing technology. Um, and essentially, um, it's a, a satellite that is able to detect fires. And as you can see at the bottom of the screen, it says a potential fire has been detected by the GO-16 in the MTR area. Um, and so the, this remote sensing technology that we're using is very helpful in early detection of fires, even before people can call it in. And now what we're seeing, at least on the CAL FIRE side, is these spot reports that will um, be generated um, for us before we even get to a fire. And it will show us where the fire is, um, how it, the direction that it's traveling, the communities that are impacted, what the weather is. Um, and um, it really gives both decision makers as well as incident commanders um, real-time intelligence about what that fire is doing, um, either before they get there or when they get there. Um, and it's, it's incredibly helpful. Um, and I'm just gonna um, wrap it up here because I want it some time for questions, but there's, there's clearly um, a community preparedness um, element to this as well. So um, it's not, this is not only a, uh, you know, a fire service um, issue. This is um, everyone's issue. And so we really try to work with communities so that they're prepared as well. And um, when, we express the need for them to evacuate, that they go when we say go, um, or if they feel threatened in advance of a fire and evacuation warnings or orders haven't been issued, um, that they're ready to go um, because they can always come back to their house afterwards. So um, with that, I am going to, um, I'm going to actually end this part of the webinar so we can allow some time for some questions. So Sarah, I will turn it back over to you. All right, if anyone has questions, you can, um, I've muted most people if you didn't mute yourself, so you can unmute yourself or you can type into the chat box and I can read the questions. Hi, Chris, this is Mary. Um, I have a question about um, the fuel reduction. So I know it's kind of overwhelming to think about how much fuel like um, needs to be reduced. I was wondering like what scale, do you typically look at that like at a watershed scale or just like land um, landscape, I don't know. And um, if there's like a priority way that you look at it as well, like more wildland urban interface or, or just whatever's available. No, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so I think, you know, uh, you have to look at both and, and, and here's why. So if a fire were to start, let's say miles away from a community um, on let's say national forest system lands or in a park or something like that, um, what we're seeing is, is those, those fires gain a tremendous amount of energy and depending on the weather can easily push into a community. And, um, and the, the same is true in reverse. You could have a fire that starts you know, within a, a very densely populated community and extend out into these larger landscapes. From a practical standpoint, a lot of the work that initially gets done obviously is within communities and around communities just to, to to have that point of defense, you know, to get those wildland urban interface fuels reduction projects in place, um, because they do actually make a huge difference and defensible space makes a huge difference as well. But having said that, um, we've recognized that, you know, at a larger landscape level, um, we also need to be doing um, forest health and resiliency projects that involve you know, forest thinning, 
um, and prescribed fire work um, to be able to address that, that part of the problem as well. Speaking from experience, um, what I've seen in Lake, the Lake Tahoe Basin is um, an emphasis on the built environment and the wildland urban interface around the communities. And now we have an excellent opportunity to expand that work out into the larger landscape while also not losing you know, sight of what we need to do um, to continue to protect our communities also. Um, so I, I, think, I think we have to address both of those things with the same energy and passion um, if we wanna be successful. And certainly it seems like almost insurmountable sometimes when you look at it, but, um, but we can make a difference and we have, to, we have to be able to start somewhere. We have to anchor in um, and we have to start that work and you know, 10 or 20 years from now, I do really believe that we will have made an impact. Awesome, thank you so much. Thank you. Chris, I have another question um, from Zach Bradford. His question is about the ha um, hazard trees. He says there's some evidence that dead trees, while a fuel hazard at first, over the course of several years, maybe more, due to natural decay of the wood, eventually reduce the fire risk around those trees. Is Cal Fire including this in planning for addressing and prioritizing hazard trees? Good question. So yeah, so um. So I learned a lot during um, the tree, my time on the tree mortality task force. So certainly there's, um, so with um, trees that, that die, um, especially you know, at a large landscape level, um, once those trees die um, and the needles are remaining on that tree and they, and they go from green to brown, there's a time period there that you see um, a, a real increased risk of uh, fire intensity because of the way those fuels are situated across the landscape. And then over time, those needles begin to drop off the trees onto the ground, and which eliminates a lot of the aerial fuel loading that you would see throughout the forest. And that fire risk will slowly start to decrease over time as that fuel loading essentially is rearranged um, to the point that a lot of those trees, as they decay and as they begin to break apart, um, and fall to the ground, now you essentially have um, um, really heavy fuels um, on the landscape, on the ground. So um, when, it came, when it really came to hazard trees and what CAL FIRE was trying to do under the Tree Mortality Task Force, our focus initially was just really on critical infrastructure, um, roads, um, homes, um, utility corridors, water conveyance systems, um, we needed to, it was, it was, the problem at the time was so insurmountable that we really needed to focus on the threat that those trees had in what we call the tier one high hazard zones. Um, now, we're not gonna be able to get to every tree, and we know that. Um, and, and, and I think that's why you saw that shift between tree mortality to forest management, um, and, and it's looking at ways to be able to um, make our landscapes more resilient so that we don't have massive tree die off like we had um, starting in 2015, um, but we have forests that can withstand you know, that kind of drought. Um, so certainly there is a change that occurs over time and we absolutely do consider you know, how that affects not only wildfire risk, but you know, what the future of our forests will look like. And I hope that answers your question. All right, any other questions? All right, well, thank you all so much for being here. Oh, did I cut someone off? Oh, sorry. I was gonna have a, another question about the biomass markets that uh, were mentioned sort of in the, in the presentation. And I know that um, there's a lot, uh, a lot of the challenge is how to get that biomass out of, out of the forest. Uh, where, where, where's Cal Fire kind of looking in terms of uh, technologies or policies that allow more access? We, we can move from pile burning to actually transporting that biomass to central locations and, and being able to utilize it for, for various purposes. Chris, so, were you good question. So, okay, good. <laughs> I, I think I caught most of that question. Um, 
uh, and, and what I understood is that, you know, where are we at in terms of like getting away from having to pile burn to actually utilizing that biomass and getting it somewhere where it could be used for something like energy production rather than being burned out in the forest. So, um, so yeah, so that's actually um, a great question. Um, I would much, much, much rather see biomass that is being generated as a result of a fuels reduction project or a forest health project go to um, some other use other than being burned in a burn pile. And I think that's something that, that we all can agree on. Um, some of the things that are inhibiting that are certainly um, costs. And one of the, the main costs is just transportation costs from the forest out to, um, um, to um, a bioenergy um, facility. And that's something certainly that um, under our forest health grants is something that we consider is you know, trying to offset those costs so that we can um, you know, get that, that material moved out of the forest to a facility where it can be used to generate um, um, energy. And um, the, the markets aren't obviously what they were back in the, you know, the 1980s in terms of the number of facilities that we had. Um, I know the nearest facility that we have here is, um, is Loyalton, um, and, and I have seen that the Forest Service here in the Lake Tahoe Basin has been successful in getting biomass moved um, to Loyalton, and a lot of it just depends on the markets at the time in order to move that material. Um, but, you know, I, I've also found that, that bioenergy is, is tricky. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, and it, it's something that I think everyone is like really seriously trying to figure out how to address that. Um, because again, we, you know, we have, um, you know, this, this raw material that again, that could be used for something good. And, and I also know that there's a lot of smaller, um, companies that are looking at, you know, trying to bring essentially smaller bioenergy facilities to the forest. Uh, where you can interconnect to the grid and, um, and actually use that as a source to be able to, um, you know, get rid of your biomass um, while also, you know, getting it into the energy grid. And, and certainly those have great um, carbon positive impacts when you're able to do that. Um, so we do have an um, assistant deputy director that works for um, our department um, in climate and energy. And, um, and she works very closely with a lot of other agencies and nonprofit groups on trying to address this very issue. Perfect, thank you. Would, would you be able to, would we be able to connect with her directly? Is that something that would be uh, appropriate? You could send around? Oh yeah, no, no, that's no problem at all. Just, um, uh, so I'll give you guys my cell phone number if you want it. Um, it's 530-708. 2706. That's 530-708-2706. Feel free to call me anytime. And Chris, if it's okay with you, I'll be sending out a um, email with the recorded webinar and um, I can include your phone number in that as well. Awesome. Thank you very much for that. That was exactly what I was uh, um, asking about. That was perfect. Thanks. Cool. All right, we've got a minute left. Any final burning questions? Great, well, thank you so much, Chris. That was wonderful. And um, I'll be sending out a follow-up email probably tomorrow with the recording of the webinar and Chris's phone number. So if you have any follow-up questions for him. Well, thank you. And thank you to everyone for being willing to take an hour of their day to um, listen to me talk. I really appreciate that. And thank you so much for this opportunity, Sarah. Yeah, of course. All right. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. You too.